It's Rachel, and I'm back from vacation to cover a topic that I haven't been talking too much about, the plan for our new permaculture lot in the suburbs. We are finally under construction after a year-long delay due to COVID-19. That delay gave me plenty of time for protracted site observation and to work on the overall site design. My goal is to use permaculture principles to make this site as sustainable as possible while still being appropriate for its suburban context. I'm going to walk through my process and the overall design in case anybody has similar goals for their property. There are three main topics in this video. First, our goals and objectives for this site, you know, why we're doing this at all. Second, a sector analysis, looking at all of the context and the big forces acting on our site. And last but not least, the resulting decisions that I've made on what to put where in terms of the permaculture tool of zones of use. Starting with objectives. We wanted to create as sustainable of a life as possible, but we didn't want to move to a rural area because we wanted to stay in our good school district and we wanted our kids to be close to activities and friends. And that meant a really lengthy search for an appropriate lot. After roughly a year of searching, uh, we did find this parcel shown as the yellow rectangle, which is the remnant of a once large farm property. You can see here in the upper left of this old image where the original farmhouse stood. The acreage around it was sold off over the years and decades to create the subdivisions that now surround us here to the north, west, and south. There's a municipal government complex to the east, and altogether that left this land sort of stranded. It isn't part of any HOA, which was key for us to have the freedom to do things like chickens, and it's large by our standards, almost two acres, but it was too small for a developer with access only from that really busy road on the north. And all of those factors together meant that it was within our price range. Now, some of our goals are probably relatable to pretty much anybody. We wanted a comfortable sized home that we could afford. We wanted outdoor play areas for our kids and for their friends, as well as outdoor socializing areas for us as adults with our friends. Because my MS management protocol does include managing stress, I'm also going to design in some quieter areas for relaxation. And last, but very importantly, a safe outdoor area for our dogs. I'll explain later why this was a concern for this particular property. Other goals are much more specific to trying to live a more sustainable and low carbon footprint. These include maximizing the passive solar gain for the house with its design as well as its location on the lot. I also wanted to have an unheated passive solar greenhouse attached to the house for seed starting. That is to support a large garden. My goal is to grow the majority of our fresh produce and herbs on site in our own garden, as well as I'm going to try and experiment uh, with a permaculture orchard that would enable production of fruits and nuts in the future. And last, and this is a new area for me, sequestering carbon as much as possible by adding more trees and plants that I can coppice on site to capture carbon from the atmosphere and turn it into woody material that we can then put to other uses. Moving on to the sectors analysis. I'm gonna start with water and topography. With any property purchase, you want to first verify that you're not in a flood zone. We did pull the FEMA map and validated that we are in an area of minimal flood risk. We do have really heavy clay soils around here and even short of a massive, horrible flooding event, if I bought property in an area that could have localized water issues, we could see basement leaks, soil too wet for a garden, other issues that would still be a problem even if it didn't constitute an outright flood. Because water doesn't respect human property boundaries, you will want to consider the broader context all around your lot and not just your individual property. This is a contour map that covers an area that's about four and a half miles tall by six miles wide, and our property is the red star in the middle. As you read this map, the red contours would be higher, and it's in rainbow order where the blue are lower. Water in the area overall will move from the higher areas in the top left towards the lower areas in the bottom right. I've circled here areas with flatter grade. Think of those as spots where the contour lines are further apart. And in those areas, water could potentially pool on a local level because it doesn't have the same slope to run down. If we were in any of those areas or in a deep valley, I'd be more worried. But as you can see, our red star looks pretty good. It's always important to verify everything with real on-site observation. And because we've had this whole year, 
I've been able to see our lot in multiple conditions, including three severe rainstorm flooding events that caused very serious floods uh, in this metropolitan area. And in all three of those, our lot had no signs of standing water or flooding, which is an important validation for me that the overall reading of the topography that I've done is accurate and this site should not have issues with flooding. Now zooming in a bit closer, you can see the conditions on our lot, including the busy street along the north edge. The northwest corner is bare and flat where the old farmhouse used to be, and there's an open pasture area on the south half. The remainder of the lot is heavily treed and we want to keep it that way and even plant more. First, we needed to remove some things. Nobody has lived on this property for about 70 years now, and it had become completely overgrown. We've spent pretty much every weekend for the last year, other than like the depth of winter, going in and tearing out invasive buckthorn. We removed a whole bunch of grape vines that we think were planted intentionally at one point based on, you know, we traced them back to the roots and it looked like there was a, a vineyard at one point, but they had just gone crazy. They had grown up into the canopy and taken over all of the big trees on the lot, choking out the sunshine. One of the first things we did was to yank those down. And that really opened up the light onto the site in a significant way. We saved all of this material and chipped it up to create some nice woody base that I'm now using to start the compost piles that will eventually be used in our garden and in our orchard. We also racked up three cases of poison ivy between us and multiple wasp stings from a ground nest that was hidden and took us way too long to find. Going back to the overhead view, you can see that the subdivision that wraps around the west and south edges of our lot has a large berm marked here in orange, and that's planted with evergreens to block sight lines into their backyards. The municipal complex bordering us on the east also has a large tree-topped berm marked here to block sight lines onto their property. I've overlaid contour lines to show the edges of those berms and to study how water will move just on our lot. You can see there is a gradual slope with a drop of about six feet from the northeast corner down towards the lowest area in the southwest, and any rain that lands on our property will generally flow in that direction. We'd expect the southwest portion to be the wettest area of the site, although not to any extreme degree. The berms will also concentrate some water along our property lines a bit since the rainfall on them runs rapidly off of their steeper slopes and then slows down abruptly when it hits the shallower slope on most of our lot. These berms act in another way that we noticed during our multiple visits. They create a deer alley coming in from the southeast corner of our lot. Zooming back out, you can see that there is a large natural habitat area to the south of our lot, highlighted here in green. The tip of that habitat ends at the berms in the southeast corner of our lot. We saw deer almost every time we visited coming in from this corner. That is not great news for my future garden. There are also deer remains on the site multiple times, fresh ones, and it was pretty obvious that there are predators active in the area, likely coyotes. That's really not good news for our sweet and decidedly non-ferocious golden retrievers. Hence, one of our objectives being to create a safe area for our dogs to be on the property in case we're not home. I synthesized all of these different factors into a sector diagram that visually conveys the different forces acting on our lot. One of the first things you notice on site is that we have a lot of traffic noise coming in from the north and some from the east, shown with the black arc here. It does have nice sun exposure. I've mapped here the sun's path in the summer and the winter, and you can see that the open former pasture area on the south half has great light exposure even in winter. Next is kids. The subdivision wrapping our lot, shown here, is this kind of light purple arc, um, that has a lot of kids living there. And we wanna make sure that we welcome them in with the design as they befriend our children. Next, an important element to always examine is the prevailing direction of your winds. I pulled up the wind rows for our area. I'll link that resource in the description. And the summer and winter prevailing winds in our area both come from the southwest. The continuous evergreen topped berm wrapping that corner provides really good protection from severe winds, but I will still factor it into the design for activities like outdoor summer socializing where we might want a nice breeze in the summer. Last but not least, our dear friends coming in from the southeast. Since I plan to grow a large garden, I will have to consider their presence and how to deflect them away from the plants that we want to eat ourselves. Moving to my last topic, let me show you how I brought all of this together to create the overall design for the property. 
For this, I use the permaculture concept of zones of use. The center, zone zero, is your house, and it moves all the way out to zone five, which would be untouched wilderness. The idea is that you identify the different activities that you're going to be conducting on your property, you think about how frequently you need to engage with those elements, and you put anything that requires frequent interaction close to the house, and things that require less frequent interaction can go much further out. In the burbs, uh, we really don't have a true zone five, right? If I want untouched wilderness, I really need to go to a, a nature area and go hiking. So I stopped my design at zone four. Starting with zone zero. Because of the road noise, our desire to save as many trees as possible and the need for passive solar exposure, we are placing the house all the way in the back pasture area and also placing a raised berm along the north to help block the noise. Now we put the house in the southeast since water would tend to run to the southwest just to be on the safe side. We couldn't run a driveway straight down without killing some large trees, so we put the garage to the east of the house and we created kind of a dog leg driveway. The downside of this house placement is that we are creating a large impermeable surface with that driveway and it will generate runoff during big rain events and I'll need to manage that. Moving to zone one, this is for activities that would occur daily. In our case, elements would include a patio on the south side of the house. I intend to build a screen to create some shade from the west evening sun on that patio. And into that screen, I'm going to build in planters where I can put herbs and salad greens that I would like to pick most of the time daily. Zone one also includes our main annual garden bed with raised beds, which will need to be enclosed by a fence to keep out the deer, as well as a deck on the west end between the house and the garden that deck covers rain barrels collecting runoff from our house's roof, which I can use to water the garden, in addition to just being a pleasant feature that we can enjoy on a daily basis. Zone two is for things we engage with multiple times a week. For me, this includes a combined chicken coop and garden shed with a compost run. This will go at the edge of zone one, west of the house and on the north side of the garden. Placing it here puts it near the center of our lot and as far away as possible from any neighbors who might be bothered enough to complain about chickens as well as being close to the garden so I can feed weeds to the chickens and easily bring compost to the garden. It's close enough to the house to get eggs on a regular basis, but again, removed enough to not bother the neighbors. I've also placed an enclosed dog run in this zone over on the east side of the garage at the edge of our lot. And our retrievers can be separate here, but nearby and protected from coyotes. The last thing in this zone is to the south of the house, an open outdoor lawn area that does need frequent mowing and some care, so it's thought of best as a zone two kind of element. Zone three is for elements that don't require that much engagement, maybe, you know, a couple times a month or less. For us, this would include the permaculture orchard uh, in the level sunny area at center north of the lot where the old farmhouse used to be. I'm gonna design that in a sun trap shape and protect it with a living fence or fedge, uh, probably made from willows. Inside that sun trap shape of the orchard, I will have some keyhole beds where we can grow longer season crops like onions and sweet potatoes that don't need much active management. Zone three also holds a play area for our kids and the neighborhood kids that will run along the west edge of the property. I'd like to create, if I can pull it off, a living willow tunnel in this area because it's a little moister and shadier and it would generate fun for the kids as well as coppice material for me. Zone four is meant to be a semi-wild space with very minimal interaction with humans. That would be my northeast corner. I plan to continue to restore the ecosystem back to the natural habitat, you know, keep getting out that buckthorn and putting other things in its place. And as part of that, I'm going to plant some understory shrubs outside of our fence that would provide forage for deer, and then another fedge of thorny and unappetizing plants just inside of that. Hopefully between this and putting our dog run along the southeast edge, the deer will divert away from the center of our lot where the fenced garden is located. If budget and time allow, I would also like to build in a walking labyrinth in this area for some quiet contemplation, but that may be beyond my abilities. I hope this overview of the design process was helpful for anybody thinking of doing something similar. I am going to do a whole series of more in-depth videos. I'm not gonna just stop here. I'll be starting with a video on zones zero and one, covering, as an example, the passive solar elements of the house and the attached greenhouse, as well as the plan for the garden, the annual garden beds that are enclosed with the fence. I'm gonna talk about plant quantities and rotation for our family of four. After that, I will move to zone two, 
uh, which in my case would be focusing on the chicken coop slash garden shed and the compost run designed for that. Moving on after that to zone three, talking about the permaculture orchard and those keyhole beds. And finally, zone four, I'll get into the, the deer fedge and how I'm gonna do the forage and the, and the barrier as well as that berm along the north to help block sound onto the lot. For those of you who normally watch my videos for backyard gardening tips, if you're not, I'm still gonna make those as the season progresses. I'm just also going to nerd out on this permaculture lot. As mentioned, I have linked the resources in the description of the video below that I used for things like the wind roses and sun path planning. If I did forget anything that you would like me to include, please flag it in the comments and I will either answer back or try and cover it in one of the upcoming videos. Until then, I hope that was helpful. Thanks.